we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Declaration of Independence. Now, John, you've had plenty of time to come up with a definition, because I asked you this in Sunday school, but I needed a definition of rights. Are you ready? To, did you have a definition? For rights? Yeah, for rights. Uh, did you fail my test? A, a right, as opposed to a privilege, is a, a power that you have in a you don't have to do anything special to get it. You're born. You've got it. And it's not something conferred on you by the government. It's, it's there. It's there. It's there. You can appeal to it as well. Yeah. Correct. And that's kind of what they were doing to this. Can I ask you, now does anyone, uh, does anyone else hold to the Constitution that it's a very, that, I mean, they absolutely love it that they, that even though maybe you weren't in the military, but if you would, you would actually fight for uh, this. I see a few hands going up. Anybody else? I mean, it's a strong document. Do you think that it is an absolute truth? Anybody here believe it's absolute truth? This piece right here, you, you notice that he appealed to what? A creator? And that he, he, he said that it's, it's obvious that all humanity have these three things. That they have what? What was it? They have the right to life. They have the right to liberty. Which, give me another word for liberty. Freedom. So they have a right to freedom, and they have a right to what? Pursue happiness. Here's my theological question from the day. Is that consistent with what the Word of God says? That you have a right to life, to liberty, to the pursuit of happiness? Let, okay, John, you have a thought quick? Is it a right or a privilege? I, I've struggled with this, and that's why I'm kind of asking the question. Let, let, me give you, let me give you a quick teaching, and then we'll get to the message. There are, does anyone know what revelation means? Revelation is something that is revealed to us, correct? When you read, it's not just a book in the Bible, revelation, all of Scripture is a revelation okay anything that comes from god is a revelation there are two types of revelation you write this down if you want i mean there's a test later there is general revelation there is specific or special revelation specific revelation is probably the, the one that baptists would be more familiar with so you got general and spe specific right there general revelation means that you can clearly see it you don't need a theologian. You don't need a ordained deacon, bap, uh, ordained Baptist deacon to tell you about it. You can just see it in nature. For example, I think that you'd have to be pretty foolish to come into this world, to exist in this world, even for a couple of years, look at the beauty that we have, know that nothing um, goes from chaos to order, and conclude anything but there, there's a creator out there. Every time, you I see a little baby back there, every time you hold a baby, I, I just can't see how you just can't give glory to something out there. You can see it. Uh, at Romans 1, there's a passage I'll share with you real quick. This is Romans 1.20, and it says, um, Since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, they have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. You can see in creation that there is a God. You know in your conscience that there are certain things that you shouldn't do. This applies a lawgiver. Let me, um, I don't know, do I have a kid that I can poke with a needle real quick? 
uh, okay, I won't do that because Miss Nellie's looking at me wrong. I was getting ready to go over there. I could go up to that baby and I could probably poke that baby with a little needle and mama would kick my butt, number one. Uh, and then two, that baby would know that I did something wrong to it. Pro from very early on, you, you know that there is a sense of right and wrong. You don't believe me? Go ask Bella. She's telling us right now, this little kid who's never studied scripture as far as I know, she doesn't even pray before she eats. She's a little heathen, unless I pray. Um, she's, she's pagan, all get-go. I'm afraid she's going to dance around fire or something. But this little pagan tries to tell me that there is a sense of right and wrong. It's like she's born with it. And nobody taught it to her. She just knows. That is a general revelation. It says in the scripture, and I'll give you a scripture reference to this. Um, Indeed, when Gentiles who do not have the law, that's the Bible, the scriptures, the word of God, do by nature things required by the law, they are a law for themselves, even though they do not have the law, since they show that the requirements of the law are written on their hearts. Their consciences also bearing witnesses and their thoughts now accusing them, even defending them. So your conscience is a general revelation but that general revelation is not enough to tell you about God there are fools out there that see the creation of the world they see everything around them and then they give glory to mother nature right is there a mother nature no it, you go to some Society, uh, societies, you go to some cultures, they may worship the sun. They may dance naked around a tree. Uh, that was the hippie movement of the 60s, which John was a big part of. Um, he was a what? Well, then that, that at least makes it a little bit okay that he was dancing naked around a tree. Um, General revelation can tell you enough that there is a God, which will eventually convict you, but it really doesn't tell you enough about God right there. Where special revelation occurs, or specific revelation comes, when God actually says it. Thou shall not kill. That's from God. God is love. That's from God. God is triune. That's from God. You would not know that unless he told you that. That in the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were created through Him and by Him. Nothing that had been made would have been made unless He made it. Jesus. John 1.14, um, the Word became flesh. You would not know that unless God told you that. You just don't get that. So that's special revelation. Go back to this Constitution, or the, the Declaration of Independence. Here's what I think, and this is why I think that the Declaration of Independence is somewhat... Is, is, is very beautiful. The information, I'll read it again, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by the Creator with unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, is what I would call general revelation. You don't need the Bible to tell you what they told you. You can clearly see it. But because of that, it's somewhat perverted. It's somewhat perverted. Let me back up. Let me go through each one. What's the first one? You have the right to... That's not the first. Life. Do you need to memorize that? Do we need a class on constitutional law? Because Hannah will teach it. Life. Liberty, pursuit of happiness. The first one is life. Do you have a right to live? No. Sorry, I didn't mean to get... I was getting all Baptist preacher on her. Take that out. And here, let's, let's record that. No, Miss Nellie. No. <laughs> Your life is a gift. You didn't earn it. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a good gift. It starts at conception. 
really. The, the, the text that I, uh, uh, I, was, I listened to Nate's sermon um, Nate, mostly to see if uh, all the good that I heard about it was true, and two, did he say anything bad about me? And um, he was very nice and generous. You even started the scripture or the, that that sermon off because Pastor Mike is not here, we won't pick on him. Thank you for that. At least you're not talking behind my back, which means that if I was here, you would be saying something bad about me. Psalm 139 says this: um, For you created my inmost being. You knit me together in my mother's womb. From birth to death, you are, your life is a gift. I shared that with the kids a little bit. If you take them home and they're a little bit scared, please don't. I asked them what scares you, and then I shared with them Miss Edith Henderson's favorite scripture that, that we read during uh, her funeral, which was Psalm 23. And even though I walked through the valley of the shadow of death i will fear no evil for you are with me because you carry a big old stick that's what i told him big old wolf comes out he'll pop him but from life to death your life from from birth to death your life is a gift given to you does any i think i've 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 asked this before uh, have you heard the term like debbie downer or like negative Nancy or, or whatever right there. One of the things that, that kind of irks me are those people who, is it maybe a false humility that they're always down on who they are in life? They, they communicate that they're too stupid. They communicate that they don't look good enough. They communicate that they don't have the, the right degree. They communicate that they are a bad, horrible person over and over. Now, there may be psychological reasons for that. There may be that that was pounded into them, um, that their mama or their daddy pounded that into them. There may be a lot of reasons for it, but for whatever reason, they're really down upon themselves. When I hear this, I, I, I just can't. I, I just have this... First off, I have the immediate urge of popping him in the back of the head in love because that, you know I'm a pastor. Um, just bam, get right. But it really talks negative about the very special thing that they are, the life. You are made in the image of God. Everything else he spoke into existence. The, 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 it says, and he made the stars. He spoke, it, let there be light. Light was there. He spoke animals into existence. He said, let there be a chicken, and there was a chicken. Then the egg came. I wish they would have wrote it down so that that poem or that riddle would have been taken care of, but it was probably chicken, then egg. So that's biblical, and I said it, so it must be right. Not, not you. Adam, I, and I, you know what? We can't, we can't picture that, but we, you probably got the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ there. And he gets on his knees and he spits in the ground and he forms the head and, and the body and, and every detail he puts in place. He probably started with the organs and then he built it around that. And then he gets down mouth to mouth and he puts his lips over Adam's mouth and he, he breathes into Adam and there you have the creation of humanity and now as, as I read in the psalm he literally gets in there and, and, and he's got this hands on approach to you how special you are how special we all are we have that above all other creation the, the creation itself where it gives glory to God at the same time was created so that we could exist made for you every day that you get is a gift from God Hebrews 1 3 says this it says the Sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being sustaining all things by his powerful world there's a lot there you could preach a whole sermon on that text easy I mean there's there's uh, the son is deity as, as God himself but it says that he sustains all things that every second every millennium every, every just 
if, what is the smallest second, a nanosecond? What is the smallest increment of time? Who's smarter than me? You all are. John, thanks for raising your hand. You must be proud, too. Get humble. What? It's, uh, it's the Planck value for time. There is, under quantum theory, a smallest unit of time. Okay. That's in that chunk. Okay, you that's don't know the actual? I think the figure, I'm not sure, 10 to the negative 31st seconds or something like that. Can we just name that after you? The John second? I think it's got a better name, but if you want to... We'll go with John second, because I'm not going to say that, what you just said. The John second. Every John second, God recreates. He holds it together. If he ceased to exist, if it was possible for him to have a sneeze and not think, you would cease to exist. Every moment of your life is a gift. It's not a right. That could be seen as a good thing. and It could be seen as a very convicting thing. My son, Gabriel, you go to my house, and um, we've, I've been busy. Uh, we've had of course the funeral and we're doing stuff for the 175th so I haven't been there my wife's been trying to work on on the shop and everything so of course it doesn't take long for them kids to destroy everything um, they're really good at it it's a gift and uh, we were talking about spiritual gifts during Sunday school class I'm pretty sure that's one of their spiritual gifts one that they share with your son Wayne um, any other kids anybody else have kids that they testify they have a spiritual gift of destruction remember everything goes from chaos to order and kids you know from no, it goes from order to chaos, and then, okay. I bought him. I remember it was during Christmas. My wife and I, we went shopping, and, and, um, and my, Gabriel likes army men and castles and all those great little things, and they found this castle that they wanted, and it, on the box it looked cool. Okay, so we went ahead and bought it, and then I got home. It was for his birthday, and sure enough, it was one of those pieces that you had to put the whole thing together piece by piece by piece. There wasn't one piece of this castle that wasn't connected to everything. So I spent about an hour and a half trying to do it, then a half hour reading the directions, then another hour trying to put the thing together. Men, testify, amen. And then once the thing was together, they played with that thing for about three minutes until it fell apart. It was kind of a cheaply made thing. It was very expensive, but cheaply made. And to the, right now, even though the rest of the house is a mess, there's a box, and that toy is in that box in, in the same condition it was the day I gave it to him. How much did we pay for that, babe? Like 40 bucks? I gave him a gift. And maybe he didn't appreciate it. I'm not mad at him, because I don't want to put the thing together again. I've lost the instructions. How many of us don't appreciate the life that we've been given? I was working on a sermon that I want to give here in a couple of weeks, and uh, I, was, I was thinking about this little girl at that time, she was about yay big, uh, maybe two, two, three years old. And you could go up to her. And she couldn't really communicate a lot. She couldn't tell you anything. She was probably about three years old. She couldn't talk um, all that much. Unless you asked her this one question. And if you could just see it, it was the cutest thing. You'd ask her, where's Jesus? I do. I love her so much. She's over there next door. 
calling. When I think about all the people in this world that are right now having a test, see if their child has downs. So that they can make a decision on whether or not to kill that child. And I think of all the people in this world who will never know that smile, those eyes, that testimony of a child. They'll never be touched because they don't value life, a gift. Every life is so valuable. From the least of these, Jesus said, from the least of these. Here's, here's something that I want you to get. Every time you devalue a life, Men, when you objectify a woman, everyone, when, when, you, when you use people, when you manipulate in a way to get something from them, when you hurt them, when you are hateful towards them, you attack a gift that was given by God, not to you. The Bible says this, it says that the evil one has come to hurt and kill. But Jesus came that they may have life, a gift. You're the body of Christ, the church. It's a gift, not a right, but so precious. Eternal life is also a gift. Romans 6, 23. For the wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, I, I got into, imagine this, a heated argument um, with a gentleman on losing their salvation about two weeks ago. The dude was mad. I mean, mad to the point where he was shaking. His eyes were bulging. I think he blew a couple of blood vessels. I mean, he was ticked. Because he asked me, we were, you could tell that the discussion had gone from, from uh, God honoring, glorifying him into something that it, that it shouldn't be. And that's where I start backing down. Before, I just like to mess with people, and like taking a stick and poking them. Right now, I know we need to glorify God. But this guy was mad. He looked at me and said, how can you tell me somebody who gets drunk every day, beats his wife, you know, is act, you, you, you know, doesn't lose his salvation? I said, well, how can you tell me that a person like that was ever saved in the first place? I said, there's a difference. Jesus didn't say, you know, I knew, you, uh, you know, hey, get away from me. I knew you one time, but then you got bad. Then I forgot who you were. He says, away from me, I never knew you. But it belittles the gift, too. God gives you eternal life. I think I wrote on a Facebook page that God can no more take away the eternal life than the, what is it, the, gobst the, the everlasting gobstopper stopper could lose its flavor. By definition alone. Eternal means forever. You can't lose something like that. But it's a gift. It's a gift right there. So, no, life is not a right but a gift. Put that down. What was the next one? Liberty, which is freedom. Is that a right? Or, do, or is it non-existent? Some would argue that there are people in this world that do not have freedom. Anybody care to take a stab at that? Do we have the right to liberty? Or were they wrong on this one? All have the gift of freedom. 
Genesis 2. It's the one that comes to my mind. 16 through 17 reads this. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat of it, you will surely die. Did God owe us this? No. I would submit to you this is also another gift from God, and I would submit that everybody has it. My, um, I shared this, I think it was last Thursday. I was teaching a class at, in, um, uh, it was, it's a black church in Champaign-Urbana, and I shared this. It was something about my father. I'll share this with you real quick. I don't know if I've ever shared this before. You remember Humco? Anybody remember Humco? Uh, um, that's over there by Kraft in Champaign-Urbana. Has anyone ever remember the smell of Humco and Kraft? It used to be back then when, when Republicans, you know, before Captain America came along and, and saved us from all the evil uh, capitalists that we, we, we like to pollute the air. So we were polluting the air back then. It had this smell to it. You remember the smell? My dad worked there. When, when he came home, I loved that smell. As nasty it was because my dad was home. My dad was home. He worked his entire life at Humco, and he hated it. He hated it with a passion. He'd come home and he just, he talked, he talked bad about it. That phone would ring, he never answered. You remember the days when you didn't have caller ID? You know, when the phone rang, it was like, it's a mysterious person on the other line. Nobody answer it. Now, we do that today because it might be a what? Bill collector, see me. He didn't want to answer it because he was afraid it was work. And he was scared to death that they would call him in to go. If you were to ask my dad, why, didn't, why, don't, why don't you just find another job? Why don't you quit? He would say, I can't. Why? But if you know anything about the factory business, they pay really good money. They pay really good money. And if he were to leave that job and get another job based on who he was, he could not make the same amount of money elsewhere. So he was stuck as a slave in that place because he was, did we call them wage slaves, I believe? But my question was, is he free? The answer is yes. He just didn't like the pain that it would take to gain his freedom. He could have always gone back to school. He could have went nights and went back to school. He could have worked two jobs. He could have not worked any jobs. He could have started his own business. There were thousands of things that he could possibly do, but he decided, I'm going to stay here because the pain of being here is less than the pain of gaining my freedom. If you, if you read in the Declaration of Independence, this was another self in uh, a, 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 a I guess a general revelation about the, um, who humans are. It says in the Constitution, all experience has shown that humans are more disposed to suffer while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. From a biblical perspective, the pain that the Jews had in slavery were, not, were, 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 were great and they were horrible and it would be better to be free, but if they were in freedom, those pains were greater than the pains of slavery, so they would long to be slaves. I want to set aside the physical limitations and even the psych psychological impairments. If you don't understand what I said, I'll tell you later. Obviously that there are um, things about the body. It says in Romans that we are part of the creation and the creation longs for the redemption of things. You could be a slave of your body. You could be a slave to your cognitive abilities. But for the most part, I want to tell you something. You have a gift from God. It's called freedom. And there's not one single person in this room that can come to me and stand in front of me and tell me that I can't do this. If you are a slave to whatever it is, 
If it is a sinful nature, if it is your situation, if it is your attitude, you choose that. Your choice. You may not like your slave driver, but you are choosing your slave driver. You just don't like the fact that there's a lot of pain involved in gaining your freedom. And you are also, especially if it is God's will that you be free, and it is. It says if you can gain your freedom, do so. And whatever thing you are, you'll be a slave of no one. You are in sin. Some of you are probably a slave. To, some of you live by the approval of mankind. You know one thing, and I think Nate would probably testify this, that's starting to sicken me about the church, is they don't have the internal fortitude. They don't have the guts to start standing up and say, you know what, the institution of marriage is defined this way. Man, one man, one woman. Because every time we speak up, somebody says, you're hateful. Well, you're ugly. How about just responding that way? You know what, we want to call name callings. We can, do, we can call names too. We don't have the internal fortitude because we seek the approval of man. Or you don't want to be, you don't want to be, uh, you don't want to seek their wrath. Some of you are slaves to the sinful nature. Oh, the temptation is too great. I must give in. You know what you are? One in denial, two a liar. The Bible says that there is no temptations that are so great. The Bible says that there is always a way out. You're a liar. You're choosing that way. Now, again, I'm trying to set aside. There's some psychological issues. There's, 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 uh, there are such things as addictions, and you need help. Um, but most, most people who are slaves, even the ones who have brutal masters, are slaves by choice. I was going to show you the, the most famous clip of Mel Gibson. Do you remember? What is the greatest movie ever made? Braveheart. You know that. And if you don't know that, well, you are also in denial. Braveheart is the greatest movie ever made. That is not subjective. That is an absolute truth. All right. Um, you don't think so? She said, I'm glad you didn't say Blazing Saddles. You know what? I, and I'll, I'm going to tell on us. No, hold on. It's funny because I remember watching Blazing Saddles as a non-Christian, and I watched it, and I thought, man, this is the funniest movie ever. And then we, then we thought, you know what, let's, let's show this in front of a youth group real quick. And then we started showing it in the youth group, and this is after I've been saved, and I'm watching the thing, and I'm thinking, this probably is not the most appropriate thing to be showing to a youth group. But anyway, Braveheart is the number one movie ever made. And then Blazing Saddles, and that's funny. That is a funny show. In the very end, what was the last word that William Wallace said? Freedom. Remember? Now, he, at that time, it wasn't... I wouldn't trade places for, with him at that time. They were gutting him. They took the, the, the metal, whatever, and they stuck it in his guts, and what they would do is they would pull out the intestines. And there were other things they were down there cutting... You know what the point was? I'm making my decision. I choose to die instead of live under this. We all are free. It's just that our choices are limited. Here's my definition, brother Greg, of freedom. We have the gift of life, and every one of us has a gift of freedom, but it is only freedom in the sense that we get to choose our master. We all have the gift of life, and with that we have been given the gift of freedom, but it is only freedom in the sense that you get to choose your master. Romans 6.16 says this, Don't you know that when you offer yourselves to someone to obey them as slaves, you are slaves to the one whom you obey? Whether you are slaves to sin, 
which leads to death, or to obedience, which leads to righteousness. You're either a slave of the law, you are a, which, is, which is man, which, or which is trying to live up to the law, the word of God, or your conscience, or you're a slave to your own sinful nature, you're a slave to men, or you're a slave to God. Which leads us to the final one. We have the gift of, we have the right of life, which I would argue from special revelation from the word of God is a gift of life. We have the right to liberty, which I would argue by special revelation, the word of God is a gift, not a right. Now we have the third, the right to pursue happiness. I, anybody, uh, I'm, I'm a big, I hate wrapping presents. I hate wrapping presents, although I'm really good at it because my wife makes me wrap them all. Or she doesn't really like to wrap them, and she makes me. So I'm a big fan of piggybacking. Anybody a piggybacker? You know what a piggybacker is? Take two of them bad boy presents, wrap them together, wrap it once. Okay? That way there's two presents wrapped in one, and it's a surprise because they wrap it up. They're like, oh, look, it's not just one present, it's two right there. I think that the right... To the gift of liberty, of freedom, needs to be in conjunction with the right to, per, or the gift to pursue happiness. The genius of the Declaration of Independence is that they never, ever defined happiness. Did you know in the other writings, though, they did define what happiness was? The pursuit of what? John, do you know this? What's that? No. Property. Because property came in conjunction with your labor. And if you were denied property, property could be money, could be resources, could be whatever, but it was property. I believe that was John Locke, the philosopher, argued that. So um, that's whatever. But, but they didn't, in whatever it is, in the Constitution, they never defined what it is that's happiness. In my earlier Christian days, when I was a apologist, probably just somebody who just liked to argue and wanted to win, it didn't matter to me if I won a soul over to the kingdom. What always mattered to me the most was that I was right and they were wrong. I still kind of like that. It's the evil thing in me that I'm, I'm trying to get away from. So um, I call it the Sarah Bateson disease. She's not here. I'm just going to just say you guys can give that to her. I'm not talking behind her back. So, you, so she may be able to hear me downstairs. So um, as I have grown matured, I like to think that I've matured somewhat in, in my Christianity, I really no longer care what people choose to do in their life. And I don't want to argue. If somebody chooses to live a life where they are chasing after wealth, I praise God that he gave us the choice. I'm very sad for them because I know that they will never find happiness. The Bible says if you gain the whole world, what good is that? Uh, the, Solomon in Ecclesiastes says, you know, he pursued the wealth and stuff. It just never meant it never made it never met that need. Nirvana, who's the main singer of Nirvana? Was Kirk Bain. Fame and wealth still was empty. What was the last thing he tried to fill his life with? I think it was a shotgun shell to the head. Some seek pleasure for happiness. If I can keep that constant, that constant sense of pleasure coming in. I think that's the, the whole appeal to video games because I can always, and, and television, because I can constantly keep pumping that in and we're so scared of the, the TV and the video game going off that we're going to be bored to death. The next thing you know, we're going to have to face the fact that it's not doing it. All it is is this constant stimulus that doesn't meet the real needs that we have. Men, what about this? Pursue accomplishments. 
one of the, and, and, and I, was, I was speaking, I'm, I'm going to end, and I'll pray here in about another minute. I don't, I don't want to extend my welcome here, of course. One of the things I was talking to another gentleman, very task-orientated people. Who are my task-orientated men? Any of them? Uno, dos, the baby raising three, okay. One of you, ta that you, there's probably more of you, you just didn't raise your hands. One of the things about you task-oriented individuals is you have to get things done. There, there's a job, there's a task, get it done, take it off the list, whatever. And, and, and sometimes you, you put the biggest task that you can because you, 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 you put your, your sense of being in that task. You know, if, if, if I join the military and I accomplish boot camp, I've done the, that, that one thing that I need to do in life. And then when you do that one thing, you're still just as empty as you were before. So men sometimes will do. They look for the bigger tasks. They look for the bigger goals in life, and they just continue to do this. i got to do this. If I just do this, then the, it's the bully in the schoolyard, as Dave Ramsey does that. It's the bully in the schoolyard. If only I can accomplish this in my life and, and, and find my self-worth, um, I think it's David Maslow's hierarchy. You college student, you crazy college students would know this more than me. But if I, that self of being, it doesn't. We have the right to pursue happiness. We have the right to choose whatever path that we want. And I could care less what you choose. Talking to a guy I'm working with down uh, to this 175th. He's drunk off of his butt yesterday. I'm, I'm messing with him. I like messing with drunk people. I try to convert them, and then they wake up, and they're sober, and they're Christians. Good night. Got a Gideon Bible on there. What did I do? He can choose whatever he wants. I care less. But I am responsible as a Christian to tell you what will bring true happiness. I like what the Apostle Paul read, uh, did, and I'm going to close with this. Phil, I, I've said this before. I've, I've, this is one of my favorite texts. Um, it's in Philippians 4. Uh, but, but man, you could put so much. and You've got to keep reading it because so many people just don't, they don't get it. So you've got to keep reading it until they, they realize that the reason they're not happy is because they're pursuing something that they ought not be pursuing, and they're missing the very thing that is right there in front of them. Philippians 4, 6 says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God, and the peace of God, there's the answer, will transcend all understanding, will, um, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. It says, Finally, my brothers, whatever is true, uh, I need to jump down. Hold on, where am I? Am I reading the right one? Such things, whatever you learned, received. There it is, I'm sorry, verse 11. I am not saying this because I'm in need, for I've learned to be content. What does content mean? Satisfied. There's another word that we use is joy. Joy, another word that we use is happy. Happiness despite the circumstances, despite whatever circumstances you were in, despite the fact that, that you are in a, um, that you're at a horrible job, despite the fact that you are uh, in, in, in just a horrible career, despite the fact that, 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 the, that the life that you have is less than ideal. For whatever reason, it is less than ideal. The Apostle Paul says in verse 11, he says, I have learned to be content, that is joyful, that is happy despite the circumstances I know what it is to be in need I know what it is to have plenty I know what it is the secret I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation whether well fed whether living in plenty whether in having that perfect relationship and I'm, I'm adding things wh whether or not I have the perfect church the perfect job or whether or not I'm in a horrible relationship in a horrible job I don't have enough food to put on the table I can't pay my bills I'm in debt people are screaming at me it doesn't matter if I have got that or if I don't got that I know what it is to be content because I pursued happiness and I found out what that happiness is and that happiness is in only one name, Jesus Christ. Somebody down there is preaching. Is he? Testify. Shouldn't we submit to the lawful authorities? No. Yes, Romans. 
but you choose to. Was that your question? Oh, yes. You have to submit to the laws. Our lawyers over here, we've gotten some legal advice, which is consistent with, that is general revelation. Specific revelation, Romans 13 says, obey the authorities. They are giving to you for a reason. They are the sword of God. Obey them.